Hi there, welcome back. All right, how long can you hold information in short-term memory? Well, there's a classic study, a moldy oldie, 1959, Peterson and Peterson, and we are going to replicate that study that shows that uh, forgetting from short-term memory is pretty fast. It's not the same speed or, or uh, brief duration that sensory memory has. Brief uh, sensory memory is very, very brief. But short-term memory is, as it's named, pretty short in duration. Okay, so what did Peterson and Peterson do? Peterson and Peterson would give people a list of letters to remember. So in this case, it's uh, X, J, F, right? That would be the nonsense letters that you're given. And then they would give you a number. And your job is to say that number out loud and to count backwards by threes for as long as the experimenter said to count backwards by threes. Now, why were they interested in your mathematical ability? No, they couldn't care less. What they were doing was by counting backwards by three, that, that takes some effort. It's attention demanding. So you can't rehearse the letters while you're counting backwards by three. So they want to see how long is short-term memory in the absence of rehearsal, okay? So we're going to try that. I'm going to show you some letters and then I'll put up a number. And so for example, here, if the number is, if the number I gave you was 481, then you would say out loud, if you can, 481, 478, 475, 472, 469, et cetera, et cetera, until I say, okay, report the letters. So you ready? I'm going to give you your first set of letters and then a number. Here we go. So 525, 522, 519, 516. Okay, what are the letters? Let's do one more, okay? Same thing, you ready? Letters and then a number. And I want you to remember the letters and then count backwards by threes from the number. And this is a replication of Peterson and Peterson. Here we go, ready? 701, 698, 695, 692, 689, 686, 683. Okay, what are the letters? This graph tells you what Peterson and Peterson found, and that is short-term memory uh, can hold information, at least these, these nonsense uh, letters, for 15, 18 seconds, and then it's gone, really. Half of the information that you're holding in short-term memory is gone after three brief seconds. So items in short-term memory disappear pretty quickly. Now what Peterson and Peterson concluded from their studies is that items in short-term memory just sort of decay. They just sort of disappear in the same way maybe that if I put a, a bowl, a, a shallow dish of water out on the sidewalk in my Southern California home, the water just kind of disappears. Right? Uh, psychologists not really comfortable with the idea that information just decays. Um, and in fact, what they thought is, why is it that we forget things? Does the information just disappear? Or does it get confused? What happens when a student is studying information and then when the exam comes, they can't remember the answer? They've studied it, but where did that knowledge go? Did it disappear? Or did it get mixed up with some other information? That mixed up theory is called interference, interference theory. And the idea here is when what you're learning now uh, interferes with what you've learned previously and what you've learned previously interferes with what you're trying to learn now. In, every, in other words, things get mucked up. So what did Peterson and Peterson do to try to test this um, uh, decay theory? Well, they came up with a nice permutation where they pitted pit time or decay against the number of letters that you had to remember. Um, and what they find in, um, actually this was a, um, a 
Peterson and Peterson didn't do this replication or this extension, an, an, another research lab did. Um, what they found is that the amount of time it just isn't supported. It's not that information just disappears with time. Instead, information dis disappears or becomes hard to remember if it conflicts with information you've already learned or information um, that you're going to learn later. Okay, so there's more evidence to support interference than there is decay. Um, because if you do the Peterson and Peterson task long enough, you just keep doing those letters, letter memories and counting backwards by threes. We only did two trials, but let's say we did 30 trials. Your performance towards the end of those 30 trials is going to be much poorer than your performance at the beginning of those trials, at the beginning of the 30 trials. Because you get more and more letters, things get confusing and they interfere with each other. Okay. There are two types of interference, and students, I guarantee you, I will test you on this. There's proactive interference and retroactive interference. Proactive interference is when old information disrupts your ability to learn new information. So, for example, uh, maybe you studied French in high school, and then you come to CSUN and you take an introduction to Spanish class, your ability to learn Spanish is hit a little bit um, by your learning of French previously. Old information um, impacts your ability to learn new information. Retroactive interference is the other way. New impacts old. So retro is something old, right? So you want to go backwards, retro, backwards. Um, okay. So let me give you some examples. I think this makes it, makes it clearer. So proactive is forward in time. That means you start with the old information and it influences your new information. So for example, you change your password, ah, right? You change your CSUN password. What happens? It's hard to remember your new password because you keep getting stuck with the old password, right? The old is interrupting your ability to learn something new. Here's a more socially relevant but super awkward uh, example. Imagine that you call your current boyfriend or girlfriend by the name of your ex. Ooh, that's not gonna get, <laughs> that's gonna be a problem, right? Um, what you need to explain to your boyfriend or girlfriend is, no, 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 you're not fixated on your ex. It's just an example of proactive interference. You're having trouble remembering their name because the old name of your girlfriend is proactively interfering with it. Try that. Good luck with that explanation, but it's actually true. Retroactive, retro, going backwards. Let's say you change your CSUN password and then for some reason you need access to your old password again. Whoops, I don't know my old password, I just remember the current password. That's retro, right? Um, another example is if you call your ex by your current girlfriend or boyfriend's name. Awkward there too, but retroactive interference. Okay, students are always asking me, how can I study more efficiently? Now, faculty usually say, oh, you need to spend more time studying. But in this class, we're not going to do that. We're going to talk about ways to help you remember more in either the same amount of time that you study or in less time. And one of those techniques is called release from proactive interference. Okay, so if I give you a list of letters to memorize, so here we've got our old friend XJF and then LTC and WBI. Let's say I give you this big long list of letters. As you get more and more uh, letter combinations, your ability to recall any, any one of those letters is gonna drop because of interference. You're gonna have more and more letters interfering with each other. But let's say I give you, mm, I don't know, 10 groups of these nonsense letters. And then on the 11th trial, instead of showing you letters, I show you fruits, right? What do we got here? An apple, banana, and an orange. Turns out your memory 
for the apple, banana, and orange is going to be much better than your memory from the last your memory for the last uh, set of letters that you were given right before the the fruit. And why is that? When you change what it is you're studying, you get rid of the proactive interference, right? Instead of more and more and more information just kind of confusing you further and further and further, you switch to a different kind of information, something that's not confusable with the past, and your memory goes way up. So what does this mean? Well, it means if you're taking, say, my class and an organic chemistry class, you should study for my class for some brief amount of time, let's say half an hour, and then switch to your OCHEM class and study that for half an hour, and then switch back to this class. Don't sit down and study one class for four hours straight. Go back and forth so you can benefit from this release of proactive interference. Okay. Last thing I want to tell you about in this lecture, again, super important for students who want to study for exams. There's something called the serial position effect or the serial position effect curve. And that is that if I give you a list of words to remember, your memory for the words or the nonsense letters that appeared at the beginning of the list and at the end of the list are going to be much better than your memory for the items in the middle of the list. And typically, when you see the serial position effect curve, you see something that's shaped like a bowl. And so in my brain, I remember this as, OK, this is a cereal bowl, different kind of cereal, but cereal bowl, and the serial position effect curve, right? Our memory for stuff in the middle, pretty bad. Um, how is that relevant to students? It means that your memory for the beginning of a lecture and the end of a lecture is better than your memory for the content that appeared in the middle of the lecture. When you read a textbook, your memory for the things at the beginning of a chapter and the end of a chapter are going to be better than what you read in the middle. Okay, those two different components, um, the two sides of the cereal bowl, if you will, have their own names. Um, your superior memory for words at the beginning of the list is called the primacy effect, because that was what you got first, primary. So better recall for information at the beginning, primacy. And the step at the end of the list is called the recency effect, because you heard it most recently. Those are the two sides of the bowl. So what are some applications? Well, if you're going to give your partner, a, you're going to tell them, hey, go to the grocery store and get us some eggs and some cabbage and some yogurt and some cereal and bananas. <laughs> Put the important stuff at the beginning of the list or the end of the list, not in the middle of the list, because the stuff in the middle of the list is most likely to be forgotten. We're entering another uh, incredible political season right now. And what happens with political ads? Well, politicians know all about the serial position effect. And so ads tend to come in two waves. You get a, good, a big set of ads that come really early before the election, maybe even months and months before the election. Those are ads that are trying to take effect, or take advantage of the primacy effect, that your, better, your memory is better for things that say about the election that you hear first. And then when it comes down to voting time, you know, social media, television, radio, what's in your mailbox, you hate to even look because half of it is political ads, right? And why is that? Because the politicians are trying to take advantage of the recency effect, that what we remember best is what we have just um, heard. Okay. Actually, I lied. There is one more thing I want to tell you about, and it's super important to students. And that is, how do you reduce the interference effect? OK, students, your job is to remember things. So interference is your enemy. How do you decrease interference effects? Well, you can take advantage of the serial position effect curve. Again, do not, let's say you've got four hours to study in. Don't sit down and study the same stuff for four hours straight. That's super inefficient. You're just wasting tons of time. Instead, 
break that material down into smaller units because you could either have one big wide serial position effect. So you remember stuff best that you studied in the first half an hour and the last half an hour, but the three hours in between, crummy memory, right? Or you could take it, break it down into blocks of maybe, I don't know, half an hour, study for half an hour, and you'll, you'll have a skinny serial position effect curve. You'll remember a lot more of the material with lots and lots of serial position effect curves taking advantage of those sides. So you want to switch topics when you study to take advantage of the release of proactive information. Uh, I'm sorry, the release from proactive interference. And you want to have shorter study sessions with a little break. So if you've got four hours, break it down into eight half an hour segments so that you can get a serial position effect for each segment, you will remember more in the same amount of time. Okay, that is it for unit number nine. My students, head back to Canvas. Everybody else, thanks. Take care.